<laughs> it looks like a robot trying to feed you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> eat my phone. <laughs> Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to Tissues of the Day. Today, we're going to be talking about media and whether or not it's valuable. My name is David Borja. And I'm Robert Mackay. And today, very roughly, we're going to talk about media as a time waster. In the first half, we're going to talk about games, TV, and internet. And then in the second half, we're going to talk about media's ability to teach us, perhaps through stories or even just through lecture and information and like documentaries and stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's just like jump into it. Let me just, uh, let's just relax for a second and just really take in that really embrace that stock footage, (laughs) that, that beautiful preview. I love it. I think they're, oh, it's about camping for a second. I thought it was like (laughs) some sort of clip they were watching on like photography and that was like the bounce light. (laughs) <laughs> no, it was a tent that was being set up. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Oh, yeah, it's totally yeah. a tent being set up. Yeah. Yeah. And see, now, I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but I feel like this is the thesis of our discussion today. Should we be sitting at home looking at the TV, or should we be outside camping? Oh, <laughs> they're is the, watching this the is thing the they question. should be doing, or at least that's the question. That's the question we're going to pose today. Um, so why don't we just jump in and talk about some games? Um, what's like one of the longest games you've played recently? Longest games I've played. I honestly have like, my attention span for games has been short. So I've gotten into several and then I sort of stop. Most recently though, it would be the Kingdom Hearts compilation. They like re-released all the Kingdom Hearts game and they bundled it all together. And so I played that. And I'm only on number one and part way in, but it's because I keep getting pulled to other games. Yeah, that's fair. That's a really good example of a long game because as far as RPGs go, it's like on the shorter side, isn't it? How many hours do you know? I think the average number of hours for an RPG, honestly, I think Kingdom Hearts is probably anywhere from 40 to 60 hours, Mm -hmm. Um, maybe longer, maybe 60 to 80, but... What's the most confusing about Kingdom Hearts is how they like branded the the like actual series because it's like there's one point five and two point five and like you know yeah. you know like it, the, it was the most yeah, bizarre titling structure. Three hundred fifty-eight over two days. <laughs> yeah, it was. That's weird. Um, and then even when they bundled it together, I think they were like confusing themselves. Hundred <laughs> um, percent. That's fair. Yeah, I feel like 40 hours is, like, as long as I'm willing to go with a game. We touched on this last time, where it was just like, if it feels like a slog, why would you play it? Yeah. You know? I Um, love this site. I've never seen this before. It actually shows you, like, the main hour count, and then for a completionist. Yeah. I've never seen this. It's so handy. Howlongtobeat.com. And it's not a porn site. (laughs) (laughs) It should be. Um, I bet you get, I bet they get a lot of hits with people assuming it's a masturbation site. um, Yeah, I, I I used to be the completionist uh, Mm -hmm. originally and now not so much. Now it's just like, I want to experience the game and get out of it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that switch was. I definitely dated a completionist in the past. Um, and it was something, it was similar to what I talked about last episode too, of it was this sense of once you have this checklist that you're sort of like moving down, the game changes from being about like exploration and to being about like doing the checklist. And there is sort of like a rhythm that you get into when you start just like working on the checklist. Um, and sometimes like the most like flowy state or whatever you can get into where it's like and then four hours have passed is when you're working on that checklist because i think it's because it's turned into something routine and something um, as opposed to something more novel you know yeah and i totally feel that difference now i feel that difference when i am going because i catch myself like i'll fall into a completionist mindset i'm like i can't leave this world until i check each corner and, and knock off all the you know the secrets and pick up all the spells or gems or whatever it might be um, but then when I notice it starts becoming like, like a slog, yeah, it, be, it becomes like, I start kind of like getting stressed out by, or yeah. I feel like I'm like certainly, um, feeling guilty for putting that amount of time in. Then I'm like, no, I don't need to be a completionist. I just need to do the thing, 
you know, hit the main storyline and get out. And then I start feeling better about it. And I think that is a big result of just being at a different point in my life where I have more responsibilities and have less time for it. Totally. Yeah, I'm looking at, uh, while you were talking, I was just looking at some of the long games that were on my list. And like some of these hour requirements are absolutely bonkers. Like one of the ones, I still haven't even beat it, but I have it, Breath of the Wild. The main story is 50 hours. The main plus extra, whatever that means. <laughs> I don't know what extra Maybe is. Maybe that's like plus the DLCs or something. I don't know. Oh, but within the DLC, they also have plus extra. Oh. Ugh. So I don't know. Maybe it's Side just like quests? do the main thing and then just do some extra stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's just very general. Yeah. Um, just spin around in then, circles in the towns. Exactly. But yeah, so if you do extra, whatever that is, you add 44 hours. You almost double the amount of time. And then if you do the completionist, you almost Holy double the amount of time shit. again. <laughs> because, I mean, Breath of the Wild is kind of famous for having this really ridiculous side quest where you're collecting Korok seeds. And there are 800 of them, and all 800 of them have super mundane challenges. And when you do all 800, the reward you get is l almost literally a golden piece of poo. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll show you. Do you Korok have a picture seed. of the golden poo? Yeah. Korok seed prize. Hestu's gift. What? It's a golden poo. <laughs> it smells pretty bad. Oh, it's full on poo. It is golden poo. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember watching a review when this game came out a couple of years ago and, and the person was like, I feel like Nintendo were making fun of me for even trying. How could they? <laughs> and it's like, well, accurate. because the game was never made for you to really get all 800 of these things, it was made so that you could take whatever path you want around the world and organically come across these collectibles yeah. and you could use them to improve your character. And but that's just like a really nice nutshell example of like this like different mentality between completionists and people who make their own way, you know? Of course. And, and I think one of the problems that feeds the completionist. I think there's some people who are innately completionist because they're like hardcore and that's their thing. Cool. Do what you do. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that something that feeds it is because we're in this age, especially now with the internet, where it's so easy to access this information, there is just documentation galore. Wikipedia's sites dedicated to like every step and everything that can be done. And so it's almost like, and I want to know what the, this, the differentiation is between the nerd who likes to document and the nerd who likes to do it. You know, like who is each and mm. who is both? I don't know. But like there's somebody who goes out there and documents everything that they can do. So then the, the doer, the completionist goes in, they can see the checklist and nobody like I'm an A type person. So like I love nothing more than a checklist, but that causes me anxiety now when it comes to a game, yeah. because then it's not as fun as it used to be. Yeah, yeah, because once you start looking, if you look at howlongtobeat.com, you could, in theory, schedule out your game time and just try to, like, make a timeline for yourself of, like, okay, well, the game is this long, so if I spend <laughs> six hours of it every week, then it will take me X number of weeks to finish this game. Yeah. Um, and a person could do that, and maybe they would find some reward in that, but, like, then it is becoming work. And, like, there is this mentality that, um, I think I touched on this last week, too, of, uh, there are people who say that they get more of a reward when they put a lot of work and they put a lot of time into the game they're playing. Um, and games inherently, like, require an amount of skill to, like, complete the challenges. And so sometimes there are tests of skill and sometimes there are tests of patience. Um, and it's really interesting to like navigate which one you're looking at because mm -hmm. sometimes to improve your skill at a game, you will have to be patient and you will have to practice. But mm -hmm. other times you actually won't be getting any better at the game from when you start to like when you finish, but because you're putting in the time, you keep making progress. And that really fascinates me <laughs> um, mm. because then you're talking about the difference between a game that is shallow versus a game that is deep, uh, mechanically speaking. Mm. Um, and there are some really fabulous writers on this. One of my favorites, uh, his website is called critpoints.net. And he talks about a lot of this stuff about like game mechanics and depth and like, you know, why 
it's important for people to have some sort of game mechanic literacy yeah. because then they know basically if they're having a deep experience or a shallow experience with a game and they can hopefully mm. like enrich their appreciation of games. I'm sort of yeah. speaking in generalities, but yeah. this is kind of fundamental to whether or not someone feels like they're wasting their time because yeah. like to me, a waste of time is doing the same thing over and over again, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think so much of this is also tied to the expectations and mentality of the person who's getting into it, right? Mm. So some people want the shallow game. They want something that uh, maybe there's a thousand things to do, but each one of those things takes a minute. And then the other person wants the more in-depth game that has maybe like 50 things to do, but it takes hours to do each one. Um, and so you can compare that to like having a dinner. Right. So some people are like, I want fast food. I want it quick and I want a thousand options versus like I'm the person who likes to sit down and talk and have a you know discussion over a meal that takes hours. Um, and so it's like there is a type for each person. And I think this what actually what's really nice about this is this transitions well into the other topic uh, that we have in this category around like MMOs. So I think mm -hmm. things like Final Fantasy and Breath of the Wild are adventure games that present you the almost the option of one or the other. I feel like games like MMOs and that are much more designed to acquire this, right? It is about you have to do a slog, you have to do repetitive tasks, and you have to grind in order mm -hmm. to obtain the next echelon. Totally, yeah. My older brother, Chris, um, has been pretty obsessed, maybe a little less lately, because like, there's just changes in who's playing the game. Um, but for probably like three weeks, he was playing Red Dead Online like every day. Um, and I think why he liked it was it did embrace some of the more sandbox aspects of Breath of the Wild mm -hmm. or like Grand Theft Auto or previous Red Dead games. But it also had this sort of like you could play every day and make some sort of progress aspect that MMOs yeah. all seem to have, you know? Yeah, I actually remember reading an article. So my my MMO and really my last one was uh, World of Warcraft. That yeah. I was like, I love the Warcraft games. I played them before. And then when, you know, World of Warcraft came out, it was like revolutionary, the big deal. I got super into it. I probably played it for about a year and a half, two years. Uh, awesome. And I was in a guild. I was grinding. I was doing raids. I was doing it all. Um, what um, species were you? Or like race? I was undead. Nice. An undead warlock. Nice. And the nice thing that came out of it, and honestly, at the end of all the slog, the biggest thing I liked about it was, um, like my was thing this that your I dude? Did, oh my god, that shadow bolt. I remember that spell. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> Was the social factor like that's what I yeah. ultimately liked? Was the social yep. factor as that's I what liked Chris likes too. playing with other people, you know, connecting with them, talking to them, and that. And that's the piece that honestly I walked away with and retained to this day. I still have about three friends who I used to play with on that that I still stay in touch with, and they're like in different parts of the world, which was really cool. But I remember when I got into it. Um, and probably around the time that I also started getting out of it is I had read an article where they like analyzed how the design of the game was and they based it off psychological principles of addiction, right? Mm -hmm. they, they based it off of this like at the start, it's quick rewards, fast acceleration uh, so that like you feel like you're, you're doing well. It's like that first free hit from the dealer. He's like, here, first one's free, and you, you try to, like, I love this, and I do it again, I love it, and, you know, it's a little bit more, a little bit more, and it's, like, quick, and it's easy, and you get super addicted, but then the, like, effort level and the reward starts kind of, like, plateauing out, and the amount of effort necessary for the amount of reward starts taking more and more and more, and so innately chemically in your brain, you want that, and you are keep going to driving for that, and so, it, like, I'm sure anyone with an addictive personality is going to get that much more into it. I don't have one of those personality types, so I just kind of enjoyed the game until it just became too much of a slog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That fascinates me, and that will be a bit of a theme probably of this conversation is a bit of addiction, and we'll get into that maybe... Uh, let's get into that sort of toward the end of this first half, because I want to mm -hmm. talk about social media a little bit, mm -hmm. as well as, um, yeah, some of these other topics we're going to touch on. Um, can we transition to TV mm -hmm. for a little bit? 
Uh, how do you feel about sitcoms? <laughs> are there any sitcoms that you are watching lately? Sitcoms, I think. Because I think there's been a shift. Yeah, maybe. And, and maybe when I think sitcoms, I think of the sitcoms that I grew up with largely, which were in the 90s to early 2000s. So it was, you know, a lot of things we have listed here. It was like Big Bang Theory, which actually actually came later. For me, it was more like Friends and Frasier and Will and Grace. Um, no. And I feel like they were the... They were like... What's the, I want to say it's like they were like the candy crush of the TV world. You know, like they mm -hmm. were like the easy, consumable, constantly available. It was there every week, right? You would see that, you know, you'd tune in and see it again. Uh, this was before streaming and, you know, having to schedule yourself. Um, yeah. But they were just kind of like this easy, absorbable TV content. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sitcoms are funny because I think... I mean, I think the multicam with laugh track sitcom is definitely falling out of favor. There's a YouTuber named Drew Gooden who recently made a video called um, The Death of the Laugh Track, I think. And he did kind of a very nerdy experiment of like the jokes per minute in a couple episodes of sitcoms, some with laugh tracks and some without laugh tracks. And sort of what he was doing was a bit of an analysis of like, do we need the laugh track? Is it sort of outdated? Do people not really care about that anymore? Mm -hmm. Does it change the stories that the show can tell? And at the end of the day, it is a creative choice yeah. um, whether or not they want. I mean, it could be a budgetary choice as well. <laughs> but um, uh, what he sort of comes to the conclusion uh, within that video is like, there definitely does seem to be a shift of like them falling out of favor and he compares big bang theory with young sheldon and how young mm. sheldon is a single camera much more narrative based much less uh hammy and just like yeah. poorly written sitcom than big bang theory yeah. um can we pull that up because i'm starting to reason. equate big bang theory to this warlock <laughs> oh <laughs> that's a very good point um, um let's do young sheldon so, you know, I haven't seen these shows, so I don't want no. to poo-poo anything that I haven't seen. But when you think about shows like Young Sheldon or The Good Place or, I mean, even like the more long-running shows now that are sort of carrying the torch of like your Seinfelds or whatever, like Curb Your Enthusiasm or It's Always Sunny and stuff like that, mm -hmm. they're shows that don't have the laugh track but still sort of keep going yeah um i'm trying to think what my point is with this anyway there's a lot of sitcoms in the world <laughs> and i think a lot of it comes down to what you were talking about of this feeling of you know just watching like watching your people like nothing really changes too much yeah. episode to episode yeah. it's just the situations that create the comedy yeah yeah <laughs> and, and then i think you make a really good point when you say that your people right mm -hmm. you become attached to the characters and you want to see certain things happen to them and you get familiar with them so there is aspects of it that like are similar to um you know like what we had talked about before around on the narrative side of things around like you want to see depth you know, and growth and change in that character. You want to see a narrative and an arc that occurs with that character. And it does generally happen. It, you know, it takes like multiple months, but that stuff does happen. And so people, that's like, that's the extra layer on top of just kind of the candy level. Like this is fun and easy. And it's like, you know, a 42 minute episode or whatever it might be. Um, mm -hmm. And I can keep tuning into it and it's just nice and familiar and predictable and easy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in a lot of ways it's there's so many similarities between sitcoms as well as late night talk shows as well as reality tv shows just in the sense that it's meant to be like just super baseline lowest common denominator type stuff you really shouldn't have to think about it very hard and it's about this sort of like just moment to moment titillation <laughs> like yeah. you can you can just flip it on at any random point um, in the program and be able to figure out what's happening. You don't yeah. really need a ton of context um, or like you don't need to have seen the previous five episodes even to know where you are. And are you are saying that's more in the, the reality show. world, reality TV world? Yeah, even yeah. with like 
late night talk shows. I feel like late night talk shows are like even less substantial. <laughs> I mean, I feel like, I don't know, I've only heard recently of any sort of continuity between late night talk shows. And I think it was Seth Meyers show. Um, and it's because they're like responding to YouTube comments or something like that. I don't know. It's like this whole weird thing, but yeah, yeah. Just the sense of, um, these shows not necessarily building toward anything and just sort of like, just like spinning a bunch of plates. And the reason you're watching is to just like watch the plates spin. Yeah. Um, I think the better shows have that sense of like building something up to see where it goes. But yeah, not everyone wants that too, is the thing. Not everyone wants to feel like invested in their show because then it becomes like a responsibility and mm -hmm. it can like veer into the thing you were talking about earlier. If it can become kind of stressful <laughs> of like, ah, oh, but what's, what's going to happen next? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and, and some people just don't have the attention span for it. Right. Especially in this day and age of internet and instantaneous access and streaming and, you know, getting what I want, where I want, when I want. Mm -hmm. um, I think it just adds to that dynamic and that problem. So I still think there's a differentiation between the sitcoms, which I think are more narrative based and are more the, for the people who like, I'm going to allocate 40 minutes or whatever, I'm going to sit down and absorb into this world. Whereas like, I totally agree with the stuff that you're talking about, like when it comes to like a reality TV show or a late night show, where it's about, I just pop in whenever I want. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, maybe some follow like a sequence, right? Some are more into the reality TV show and they watch every time, but it's so much easier to kind of just jump in when you want, how you want, and for as long as you want to. And it just like caters to that and it doesn't really matter, right? Even in some cases, like I remember watching uh, Survivor, you know, the original reality TV in that. And when I started mm -hmm. getting bored with it, then all I like actually looked into was the results. You know, it's kind of like voting, which literally was such a big thing. And, and Survivor was like, you know, I don't care who gets voted in as long as I just know who, you know, like who at the end. And so I'm just look at the numbers and be like, oh, John was voted off the island or, you know, like this person was voted into the, you know, prime minister seat. Like it's for some people, that's a thing. Um, and so I think each one caters to a different audience. But I think reality to you, why it's probably doing so well. And I really I don't know if it's doing any better than than sitcoms. But I think it's because of the internet age and because of people who want to have easy, accessible hmm. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder about that too. Because, I mean, I'm going to get to this super soon about this book, The Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television by Jerry Mander. Very unfortunate name. Um, but uh, he talks about this problem of the idea that technology should be like technology is neutral and technology um, is just a tool and that like the medium couldn't possibly dictate the kind of messaging that comes through it. He really har argues against that and basically says like TV is made in such a way that only certain kinds of messages um, can carry their power through it. And the sort of like long form, information dense, text heavy, or whatever you want to call it, stuff closer to like books and lectures and whatever else, don't translate as well to the medium of TV. And he spends a lot of time in the book sort of breaking down that sort of weakness of the medium. And then also breaking down a whole bunch of like psychological and like physical problems that TV might be causing for people. That stuff gets a little like fuzzy mm. for me, but it is still very interesting because he's like drawing out a very solid perspective about why tv is evil <laughs> <laughs> um so before we even get to that uh because i do think there are some similarities with what he's talking about to what we can say about social media which we can close this sort of section with mm -hmm. um but even before social media because you and I have been around before social media sort of took over. Yeah. Um, you know, pre 2006 ish or whatever, uh, like pre MySpace even like people were just going to websites and just like looking at content on websites because people were just like finding things. Yeah. There was no reposting of that content and giving your own spin on it. 
Yeah, like E-Bombs World. <laughs> or, oh my gosh, E-Bombs World. Yeah, or I'm Bored.com. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can you what was the others? one, what was Strong Bad on? Oh yeah, HomestarRunner.com. Home, so, That's home a Star classic. Runner. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Oh no, it's totally true. And, um, you know, looking at um, the sitcoms there, just for a moment, like that reminds you of the fact that um, sitcoms, you know, they are also kind of fall, I think, into that easier, more accessible, bite-sized media consumption. Mm-hmm. But uh, it has a little bit of structure. Often they have segments, right? They always have their like segments. Like right now we're doing like commentary on this. Right now we're doing this game. Right now we're doing the band section. Right now we're doing the like sing with the guest section. Right now we're doing the interview with the guest section. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think they have a little bit of their own structure that they try to maintain. Um, But ultimately, yeah, it's still kind of like that accessible and easy to, to grab stuff. And... It's interesting if this is the perspective within the book. I Maybe we can talk a bit more about that when we hit it. But I disagree in that I think any medium has the capacity to be as in-depth or shallow as it needs to be. It depends upon how you use it. And I think probably where that perspective comes from is that largely we've set precedences for each media form, right? Like... TV and film and internet all have just the, the, the major producers have produced an expectation of each form. Uh, and we, and I also think that like, we are very much looking in the lens of just North America. Who knows what like television is like in like Eastern Europe or the Middle East? Like I couldn't tell you, but I bet they have a different perspective. Totally. Yeah. Um, I don't have the quote in front of me, but I believe in at least Argentina, there are like government laws around what can be broadcast and like certain hours of the day that are like, yeah, just what you can show during certain hours of every day on television. Mm -hmm. So there definitely are some rules about it. And yeah. And again, I don't want to just like, just poo poo all. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to paint with a broad brush because I've had plenty of very lovely experiences with all of these things, with sitcoms, with late night interviews, with, um long video games even with reality shows like i have watched every goddamn episode of queer eye um yes, and i, I know have. even the japanese like, stuff yeah. yeah and i know it's just like it's a pretty silly little show but like every once in a while i'm like ah, that's really nice as yeah. far as reality tv shows <laughs> you have go that emotional part <laughs> and it feels mhm um yeah. so you know I think I think we're we're sort of making the same points repeatedly um, where it's just like with any medium similar to what you were saying, there's like a capacity for just wasting people's time and there's a capacity for enriching people's lives. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think most self-respecting artists and creators want to make something worthwhile. And then you start getting into this murky territory of like, well, what is there a market for? And the reality is there is a market for very lowest common denominator, just like simple stuff, which is why all of these things, generally speaking, are very successful. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because they can like appeal to like a broad base of people, uh, which is fine. Like if the, if a lot of people like it, a lot of people like it, but then you get into this, um, thing like I was saying before of the difference between a deep appreciation for something and a shallow appreciation for something like you can make a habit out of watching something but when you start to analyze that habit if it starts to crumble and you actually like you're just invested because you put in the time or whatever um then uh that's it you know (laughs) yeah yeah Uh, and some people are fine with that again and this is sort of this like tension between what is a quote unquote meaningful media experience? Um, yeah. You know? And it was also the question of like, does it pull us away from real life? Mm-hmm. And my argument would be is that it's part of real life. It's Ooh. not, it's not, you know, they're not two separate entities. They're just part of what we are. So even before the media, and a lot of what obviously what we're talking about now is modern day media that we think about is like electronic. So it's the TV and the internet and film and, um, uh, you know, even radio. But, like, let's throw back to, like, the days of the advent of the book, 
right? And th- that was a yeah. form of media that most of the time people were then out in the, you know, like, gosh, and I don't know where that would go. It'd go into like the Roman days or the Egyptian days where scrolls or books were being invented and that. And I'm sure the person who was like, in a book, they were like, get your head out of that. You know, there's an outdoor world. You should be like chasing chipmunks and hoops and sticks, you know, like whatever they were doing back then, there was that media still was part of that real life, but it was probably looked upon as like a distraction um, from the other things that are in life. And I think regardless of the point in history or the media that you're talking about, it's still part of life. It's about creating a striking a balance with it. Uh, and the mm-hmm. problem is, in this modern day, the, the thing that really makes it difficult is that because of technology, the way it's evolved, and it's because the internet is so readily available and it's so quick and easy that it's starting to pull on more of the addictive qualities, right? Yeah. So we're looking at BuzzFeed here, right? Like, it is the tabloids of the internet. It is the trash easy quick and it's always like the headline is quick and catchy the content is short and like maybe poorly even written who knows and it's probably just like 30 seconds or less absorb absorption materials um farm bill right we're looking at that one now it's like (laughs) farm bill is like just constantly available go in grow your strawberries harvest Mm -hmm. them buy more strawberries um so it's the that's where it's like i think it's becoming a new where we've hit a new echelon where suddenly like because technology has made it so accessible all these media types um have become more addictive and some people are designing more things around it so it used to be like the addictive qualities were designed into like snacks and television but now even the way television is being created the way internet content is being created created is to feed into that yeah yeah Okay, great. This is a super good, uh, what do you call, segue into social media because uh, I'm obsessed with social media right now. Not the, like, actual using of it, but just thinking about it because I've deactivated my Facebook account. I recently just, like, got off some uh, profiles. Like, I took a long Twitter break um, because... Yeah, I don't know. It was just, like, really agitating me. And uh, I deleted a Snapchat account. This is maybe a funny story. I realize this is a bit of a, like, heavier episode. I hope people don't feel like we're <laughs> preaching or whatever, but whatever. Um, uh, I had a Snapchat account. This is going to be lighter, which is why I said that. <laughs> um, so I'm pretty recently single, and I put my Snapchat name onto, what's it called? It's called, like, gay snapchat it's like a subreddit just for like gay snapchat yeah. um and what guys do is just put their handle and then they put a like picture of themselves they'll give like a sort of descriptor of themselves and it's totally just for people like fucking around on snapchat yeah. they're just like totally happy to trade totally into this and this uh-huh. uh, i'm this type or whatever and people will um add you on snapchat and like just chat you up or they'll send you random dick pics um and what had happened was i um had shared this snapchat handle just enough where the 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 account was becoming overrun (laughs) by dick pics Mm -hmm. and just like random things being sent but also even just people's stories like they just didn't give a didn't give a shit they were just putting their penises just all over in like these stories that anyone could watch if they followed them or added them as a friend and i was like i can't even look at this app anymore it's just like too it's just too much it's too much nudity yeah so anyway um going back to the thing you were saying about things being addicting and sort of playing into um our like want to check on stuff Mm -hmm. um or our want to like or vice versa, um, companies engineering their apps or their social media sites or even their streaming platforms. Like, how many notifications do you get from Netflix reminding you, like, hey, you've got some stuff on your watch list. Yeah. Check it out again. Yeah, and it's yeah. something you've already seen. And it's yeah. just weird. Or there's um, the coming soon thing now that it's like, hey, you know, you've got stuff on your watch list. And guess what? There's 12 other things that are related that are coming. 
remind yeah. yourself of it. And I like, I get caught into it. I'm just like, ooh, remind me of this. Remind me of that. Totally. I know. I've done the exact same thing. I'll like watch a couple trailers and I'll be like, yeah, maybe, maybe that looks nice. Um, and then when it comes around, the like release date launches. I'm like, ah, I don't have time. And then like a couple weeks pass. And then I'm like, uh, what was that show again? <laughs> it's just like, why, why, why is this on my very, list? Yeah. yeah. It's just a very weird um, relationship with this sort of like, uh, what do you call? Like instant gratification mm-hmm. culture with media. Um, and I think that's maybe at the heart of the social media problem is like, <sighs> I want to, I want to phrase this really well because I watched the social dilemma, which is a documentary. Maybe I'll come back to it later. Um, about these problems with social media on like the development side and how there are pretty like serious, like ethical problems with social media at both it's like designed to capitalize on people's attention, how it funnels people into um, ideological bubbles so that they just keep hearing from people that already agree with them and like get validation for their opinion because their friends agree with them and stuff. And, um, you know, some other problems like spreading of fake news and like, you know, the, the like boring true news does not spread nearly as quickly as uh, hyperbolic fake news. Um, Mm. And this is something that they talk about pretty in depth in that documentary. And the problem with that is they talk about this very similar feeling um, that, you know, uh, the people within tech say, well, the technology is a tool and we have the ability to correct it and like find a way to keep this tool at our disposal and just steer it in a more ethical direction that doesn't feed into things like divisiveness people comparing themselves to each other and feeling badly about their life and Mm -hmm. um you know misinformation uh but the problem is because so much of the construction of social media um like content and like how it feeds people their content is algorithmic and not just like created by a person. There are literally like trillions of pieces of content that are sort of like moved around um, or at least billions. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, It uh, it's a really, really difficult case for tech companies to say that they do have the tools to steer this in an ethical direction Mm -hmm. because the whole reason it went in this unethical direction is because of money like oh yeah (laughs) they have just tried to maximize people's attention and focus on their social media platform and so it's devolved into this lowest common denominator problem that i've been talking about that was a whole long thing what is that making you think of? Oh, <laughs> well, man, I mean, we could just do a whole thing on, <laughs> like, the topic of, like, how the decisions in the design of products and services are based off of the, you know, demand of the capitalist system, which requires money. So all these businesses are like, we need to operate. So we have to make money in order to, you know, give ourselves money to exist in this capitalist system and to put a roof and over the head and food into the mouths of our children, our family, our dependents, whoever, you know, whatever your situation is. And so that system innately then pushes the decisions of their products and services they create around um, the the design decisions to make the products like we like, we need people using these products all the time and as frequently as possible. And uh, with enough motivation to pay. So even those freedom models and stuff, it's like we need to convince people to pay for this thing somehow. So all the design decisions then ultimately become around using those addictive properties, around making it like quick, easy, frequent, in your face, repetitive, um, and, you know, fun. So it's um, it's a little bit of like the, you know, double-edged sword, right? They're creating a thing that people... I think enjoy and 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 um, have fun with and do what they can. Oh my gosh, see, look, look at that! Look, look at all the stimulus going on on that screen, <laughs> <laughs> all the things exploding and the colors and the numbers popping up. Um, it's those are all the factors that will draw you in, will make you want to use yeah. the product more, which will make you more motivated to give money, which will make the business run, which will you know keep people happy. 
So yeah. it's it's unfortunate, but we're using. And I remember, like, I was in design. I still consider myself a designer, but I was like in user experience design for ten years. And there was a lot of discussion around what is our moral and ethical responsibility to make sure we don't put this into an unsafe space. So with with tools like Facebook, I see things like, uh, you know, and it's true, like the algorithm causes problems, but I see that they're trying to make some algorithmic choices to make it more about connection and depth and less about just addictive usage. And so I see things like the, um, what is it called, like the memories. So you have like memory that pops up and it's like you and this person have been friend for 10 years or you had this photo with this person five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's what, to me, that's them trying to make ethically responsible decisions in their design and uses of the tool. And then there's a shit ton of other stuff that doesn't. Um, I am like you. I use social media. Like I've always really struggled with it. Like I want to post more on social media, but I'm trying to figure out what is my version of posting. Let me just say real quick, everybody feels like they don't post enough on social media. Yes. And I think if there's no greater symptom of like what the problem is with the existence of these platforms, I think it's that. If you talk to anyone, I mean, most people, there are people who are very staunchly like, I don't have a social media account. I do not care. Um, yeah. But a majority of people are like, oh, like, you know, I just haven't posted in forever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, carry on with what you're saying. No, I, I totally agree. And I'm, I, I don't think I'm in the minority. I just try to like, I guess the thing for me is that I try to use, if, if I use social media, like if I was more of an active user of social media, I think I'd use it to, for like self, I want to say self-awareness, but like um, self, uh, 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 like, like acts of self-gratitude. And things that I appreciate, and it, like a, a like a conscious practice of like these are things in my life that make me happy and joyful. And oh, that. that's interesting. You know, like that's what I would want to use it. It's almost for my own purposes, but I still haven't gotten there because I have. You're not a... grateful for anything in your life. No, I am so <laughs> ungrateful. I can hate everything. <laughs> Screw it. I'm gonna post things that I kill. Um, <laughs> But that's what I would want to use it, but I haven't got there because what I find is I use it a very utilitarian way. I use the messenger, I use it for events, I use it for just coordination. Um, And what if I ever find myself in what I call the scroll hole, where I'm Mm -hmm. just scrolling through aimlessly, I close it. I like, I stop myself. That's where I'm like, I don't like social media, where I'm like, I find whatever minutes, seconds I spend scrolling through somebody else's life, I should have been spending on my own. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I could talk about this forever, um, but I want to maybe close this section of like mm-hmm. media being a time waster um, with a quote from Jerry Mander. Uh, <laughs> his name, his name Mander. is so bad. <laughs> um, do you know what gerrymandering is? You know, gerrymandering, isn't that when yeah. they like just talk forever? No, no, that's filibustering. Filibustering. A gerrymander um, is when the divisions of voting districts are sort of drawn artificially to segregate people, basically. Oh, um, gosh. So that, like, votes from particular, like, groups of people don't necessarily count in the same way that others would. It's much more of a problem on, like, the local politics level of, like, at your, like, mayors or your... I mean, I guess in Canada, your... Um, your MPs. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how common it is in Canada if it's been like a hot button issue, but it's definitely been a hot button issue in yeah. the States. Anyway. So yeah, his name is Jerry Mander, <laughs> sure, <laughs> but yeah. I want to, I would just want to talk about, or want to read a quote from him. This is from four arguments for the elimination of TV. Imagining a world free of television. I can envision only beneficial effects. What is lost because we can no longer flip a switch for instant, quote unquote, entertainment will be more than offset by human contact, enlivened minds, and resurgence of personal investigation and activation. What is lost because we can no longer see fuzzy and reduced versions of drama or forests will be more than offset by the actual experience of life and environment directly lived and the resurgence of the human feeling that will accompany this. What is lost by the unavailability of escape from what may be the painful conditions of many people's lives might be more than offset by the reason 
by the concrete realization that life has been made painful more to some than to others, and the desire to do something about this, to attack whatever forces have conspired to make this so. Once rid of television, our information field would instantly widen to include aspects of life which have been discarded and forgotten. Human beings would rediscover facets of experience that we've permitted to lie dormant. Mm. And I think he wrote this in 1977. And it's just as relevant right now to this problem of the attention economy, people feeling like they're a little bit frazzled, they're not sure if they're like watching the right things or they're not they feel like they could be like spending their time a little bit more wisely and all of this stuff um and you know i just challenge my like my personal goal in life is to try not to have anything in my life that i can't take a break from for a week um and if i can't take a break from it for a week like if i start feeling like this itchy feeling or whatever, like after a couple days, then I realize I may have a bit of a compulsive relationship with whatever that is, whether it's, mm. you know, checking social media or like reading headlines that are very like triggering and emotional or playing video games. Like it can be anything. Um, it could even be, uh, it could even be work if I'm being totally honest. Like it could be uh, like just a way to just like turn the working brain off of like, okay, how much do I use work to just like distract myself from other stuff like my relationships or like my own self-care so i if i could just put a bow on any of that it's just that uh i think at at the end of the day there has always been a sort of war on books and i wonder sometimes if the mm. evolution of technology has just been a step against books <laughs> and if because i've talked to someone my age multiple times since dating where they're just like i hate reading um and i'm like oh no <laughs> <laughs> you're one of those you're one of those people yeah um because like i think i think you you said something very interesting before when you when you said that books even when they came out there was sort of a stigma against them of like what are you like what are you trying to put in there and that's why like book burnings have always been a thing whenever there's been like a genocide or like a horrible like cultural erasure or whatever mm -hmm. book burning has been part of that because like whether we like it or not like writing things down gives them power yeah. um and i think if we if we can connect more to this sort of like active engagement with written words and with books and whatever else um I think we can develop this sort of like internal world and our ability to like feed our own imagination and not necessarily just have stuff fed to us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. That, that like, I mean, you, you, you didn't just put a bow on that. You put a whole new packaging on that. Cause there's like <laughs> new content in there that we could like, I think totally like write it down, write it down. We could do a thing on this. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> it it is my bow that i add to that would just be it's largely around i think balance balance and everything right mm -hmm. we're going to have media we're going to have social media we're going to have technology and we're going to have this tech exactly. in our life regardless but we need like you say you need to be able to step away from it you need to be balanced about it and you need to be able to just come up for air you know um, cause otherwise you're too deep into it. Um, and I think of this as almost like similar to the forest from the trees metaphor of like, if we're in the trees too much and we're taking in all that is the trees, every tree around us and all the, you know, the content of the trees, it's going to become overwhelming and we'll never really have a sense of the total picture we're looking at until we step out and see the forest and think of it almost like, you know, that feeling when you're walking and doing a hike. You're taking in so much, right? Because so much is going past you, going past you, going past you. And then finally mm -hmm. you reach the top of the peak of that mountain and you come out into a clearing and you see all the trees for their totality as opposed to individually. And so I think that, and you get that sense of breath, of calm and of stillness. And I think we need to strike that balance with the way that we consume media. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're in... 
I think this is a good contrast to have because I'm totally willing to go hog wild and say like, you know, the less media you have in your life, the better off you are. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I think you're a bit more measured, which is which is good. I think that's a good contrast. And to have. and but also being balanced <laughs> means less, right? Like because yeah. I think both of us are over the top. I think I take in too much. I think you maybe take in less, but I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah. Um. Okay, so that was a bit of doom and gloom, but I do want to acknowledge that like. I, I like I have had very positive experiences thanks to media and I think there are like I was saying before there are artists that try to hold them to a really high standard I mean like myself included like I work in media like I'm a video editor um, I've made comics and like all of that counts that's all like image based stuff similar to what we've been talking about um, so as as I saw it there's like sort of two major categories of like media's ability to enrich our lives or teach us lessons. And it was either teaching us through stories or like allegory or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and just teaching us through like information and lecture. Um, what's a story that you have enjoyed lately <laughs> and has sort of left you with like a really strong impact? You did mention one, but I'll leave it up to you if you want to talk about the more emotional one. <laughs> Oh, oh, um, are we talking like from the, the, the pieces that we identified? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, I'll call upon that media piece. Like it was call me by your name. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a huge hit, maybe on a cult level. I'm not too sure, but I, I believe it was pretty widespread. And it was. as a queer individual, uh, seeing that kind of coming of age, coming to terms with um, not only just like your sexuality but also about like how you relate to somebody of the same sex or somebody that you were sexually attracted to at that age especially because it was a kind of like an older man younger man scenario um the it was just very relatable because it's not just about kind of coming to terms with who you are it's coming to terms with like how do you relate to another person who's who's either gone through that or going through that and the like you learn so much and usually it often ends in heartbreak but it kind of needs to happen in order to learn those lessons totally yeah, yeah it's a beautiful movie there there is a review that i recorded once closer to when it came out i think the start of 2018 um and i didn't get it the first time i saw it uh i was pretty like closed off to it and then uh over time and after reading the book I like totally came around and the story will have a soft spot in my heart basically like forever <laughs> because yeah. of that of like literally going through this motion like literally the romantic comedy like story structure <laughs> but with my relationship with a movie <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> where at first i was like like all stand off i don't need you <laughs> yeah and then, and then just being curious and doing some research getting to know it a little bit better mm -hmm. and realizing oh Oh no, it is it is real nice. Yeah, there's more to it than I thought. Mm -hmm. Um my my I like obviously as I said, I had like a bit of a personal aspect to this film that I won't go into, but mm -hmm. my experience of just the film alone as it stands alone was that I thought it was very beautiful. I mean, I cried probably three different times in the film, which I don't do often watching movies. Mm. Um and I Do you remember just... a particular moment that got to you? Oh, gosh. I don't, honestly. I think yeah. they're probably the classic, like, wherever the music was swelling and they were, yeah, like, yeah. just reuniting or parting, it was probably where I was crying. <laughs> you know, like, the, like, realization moments. Um, but the thing for me was, like, I thought, okay, this is really beautiful. This is really lovely. I can relate a lot to this because, you know, it's exactly I am, you know, one of those individuals. But the thing that bothered me about it was that it was like, this is so idyllic. Idyllic? Is that a word? Like, the yep. it, like I, idyllic. Yeah. Um, because it was like Italian villa, you know, countryside, perfect weather, very attractive people. They happen to like live across the room for each other and had this door that was conveniently, you know, attached to the two rooms. There was a secret getaway place where they could go and meet. And I was just like, mm, too much. 
But <laughs> I don't mind that because I forgave it because the narrative was so great, the characters were so great, and uh, the acting was so great. But because also because it is media and it's because it's art and because it you have creative license to set that up. Sure, set up an idyllic scenario, whatever. What I'm actually learning about isn't that. It's about, you know, the, the human condition. Hmm. Hmm. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's such a fascinating movie. Because yeah. that was like one of our major criticisms of it when we were um, reviewing it was like, you know, what's the, like, what what's at stake here? What is, like, the emotional problem? They're yeah. both beautiful, and we were like, I don't know, just on reflection, it's just not necessarily one of those stories. And, like, the problem, too, is in the book, like, the emotional stakes are way more real because it's all from the younger guy's perspective, from Elio's yeah. perspective. Yeah. And so Who you had the bigger into. stakes involved. Exactly, because he was so much more, everything was so much newer and scarier, um, and he just felt so, like, unworthy of this kind of relationship. Um, and, like, unsafe, if we're being totally honest, mm -hmm. in the 80s. Um, so, yeah, all of that is super interesting. And so, yeah. what would you say, uh, like, did you feel like it taught you anything about the human condition? Um, it's interesting, because I think as a older gay man <laughs> like as, uh, somebody who's been through more of that i feel like i learned a bunch of those lessons however for me it was more about validation and um justification of like oh what i went through was real what i went through uh is shared Ooh. by others what i went through it can happen again what i went through is um is is poignant and and so like that's where like the lesson is is like maybe for somebody younger it's just about like oh i'm i'm in the same space and i'm going through the so same thing to others it's just like it's it's that validation this that um satisfaction of seeing your story on on the screen and so whereas like earlier we were talking about how like you know film and media can be a total time suck and pull you away from real life i'm like well sometimes it captures captures real life sometimes it shows us those narratives that are like relatable and true and real and so it is a good teaching medium hundred percent yeah yeah that hit me I, I think about that all the time of like trying to write stories that can bring people together whatever that means um but yeah this idea of what i went through was real like because you have now seen it yeah. in some fashion um like shown on a screen because yeah i've gone You're through not a lot of classic yeah right? exactly because i've gone through some phases with this idea of like how important is representation um, on screen. Because I think a lot of discussions about representation are about race. Um, they're also about like gender identity and sexuality in a lot of ways. Um, and sometimes representation is just, do I see a person, you know, that is like diverse in some way that doesn't you know, that just, like, doesn't fit into, like, the same old box we've been seeing for the last 50 years. Yeah. Um, and it might not even be a story about that person's lived experience. It could be about something very unrelated, like, but they just exist in whatever world the story is trying to tell. Sorry, I'm speaking in generalities, but I'm going to bring it to this HBO show in a second. I May Destroy You. Um, oh, go on. So... The other thing that happens with representation sometimes is you get into this like muddy territory where the people who are being represented may feel frustrated by whether or not that representation was like positive or negative, like mm. flattering or unflattering. Mm. And then you get into this very strange territory of do we do we only allow like positive representation or do we allow all of the sort of messy aspects of being a human being no matter what the identity is being displayed on screen i certainly like feel the latter much more strongly but i have had conversations every once in a while where someone will be frustrated with let's say the villain in like a comic book movie or whatever because the villain is 
um, a woman or the villain is black or the villain is gay or like whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're frustrated because they would much rather just see a positive representation of that identity rather than them being the villain. Even though you could argue that it's good representation for there to be <laughs> for there to be like all different kinds of people of any yeah. identity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because Just they do exist. All, let alone <laughs> the role that they're playing, be it like protagonist or antagonist, good or bad. Yeah. 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 So I struggle I struggle with that sometimes, but I think the goal as like the the, <laughs> the least uh I don't even know how to describe it. The least offensive goal that i can think of is to just try to make three-dimensional like believable characters to the best of your ability like Mm -hmm. whenever you can and then you just hope that it all shakes out and someone sees what you were going for you know yeah and if you if you can like consult with people um within that identity and make sure you're not doing something that's like totally off base like totally (laughs) offensive and like has actually been done yeah exactly stereotypes like two-dimensional like dehumanizing yeah. stuff that has been done before you know yeah or if it's being done let it be done in a way that this is a lesson what not to do right mm-hmm. that's and i think that falls in the comedy space uh where sometimes mm-hmm. comedy uses stereotypes and uses um uh mainstream predictable representation because what they're attaining or attempting to do is to be like, let this be a lesson of why this is silly and this doesn't exist and that we can laugh at this because there's actually deeper, more well-rounded individuals out there in the world. And that is a really like sensitive space because of all the um, discussion and effort to be more progressive and to represent things more um, three-dimensional, as you say, you know, like, I think like, I love comedy. I'm a comedy person. I've done a lot of comedy. Uh, Who doesn't like a good yuck, yuck and a knee slap. Right. But, but the thing is some of my favorite comedy I've ever seen has been the ones that has heart to it too. Right. It isn't Mm -hmm. pure and utter comedy. It is well-rounded and there is like some depth and some character background and some heartfelt moments. So I think of shows like um, Skeleton Twins, which was a comedy, but it was a dark comedy and that dark Mm. element gave it depth. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So it can be done. It can totally be done. Yeah. Yeah. Even like, um, I mean, this is another HBO show, but like Barry, uh, which also has Bill Hader in it. Um, it's like on on one hand it's like a thriller about an assassin and on the other hand it's this very strange awkward like romantic comedy about a terrible actor um <laughs> and who's like trying to make ways with um a young actress in LA uh but he can't like he's just not a good actor so he keeps yeah. like messing <laughs> it up and so it's like yeah i don't know it's just like part rom-com part like heist (laughs) like assassin thriller anyway the hbo show i may destroy you i want to bring up because it's a really fascinating example of like negative representation that is also three-dimensional and like uses i've um, never seen it so i'll leave i'll leave this to you mm, um thank you uh (laughs) it basically is about uh consent and sexual assault and the sort of murky steps that a woman goes through to like recognize she was assaulted Mm. report it to the police sort of deal with that trauma and how it affects her sex life after that point um waiting for the police investigations to go through finding strange ways that she starts to like speak out against Mm. sexual assault and like creates like a platform for herself across social media and the story sort of expands from there but i just want to touch on a specific moment in that show um that was really uh affecting for me personally um so there is this moment where a younger gay man in like his mid-20s um or late 20s uh he has been sort of like going on quite a few dates and like experiencing hookup culture and just like having 
you know, a general, like, casual sexual time. Gay old time. Yeah. And he goes on a date with this guy who is DL um, or down low or in the closet Mm -hmm. um did i get that right is that what dl stands for (laughs) yeah i learned about that more recently oddly enough and i'm the older gay here uh yeah okay yeah it 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 depends it's either like they're being discreet and they want to know other people to know or it's because they're not out Yeah. yeah so he goes out with this guy who is discreet and the discreet guy is just like trying to figure out his attraction to this gay guy in his 20s um and the gay guy in his 20s is happy to just sort of like walk around and chat and like talk about male attraction and whatever else um like not need to label the guy as like gay or bi curious or anything it's just like well okay you like what you like um that was all well and good and then they i think they go on a second date and they start wondering about meeting up with a third guy um so that the discreet guy could possibly watch the two of them uh have sex and like mm. figure out how he feels about that experience <laughs> like just step. being in the same room while that's happening yeah. um and so you know they show up at this guy's house um no names are exchanged and they just sort of like you know the younger guy and this third guy go at it have a good time and they're like does the does would the discreet gentleman like to partake um, <laughs> what a and fine and sort proper of, offer and he just sort of like stands back and is just like oh no like i'm good um and then he uh he leaves i have a point with all of this um but it requires little bits of information mm-hmm. um so sorry i'm just checking the time you okay cool we'll probably wrap up soon um so the discreet guy leaves and then it's just the two of them hanging out and so they have sex and they finish and then the younger guy gets ready to leave and then the host blocks the door doesn't let him leave and basically assaults him like dry humps him like with his clothes on and this was the person who was watching uh no 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 this was the host like the new third guy the discreet oh. guy who was watching had already left oh. um so like nothing could be done so yeah it's it's a very very difficult to watch rape scene as they all are um and from that point you know it's just like it's it's so uh tense and sad and like heartbreaking and then the younger guy leaves and he i guess i can put up the thumbnail of this show wherever that is so he leaves and he starts coming to terms with was i assaulted basically all the same steps that his Mm. friend had gone through in like an earlier section of the show and he goes through this weird experience of like the police not taking his request seriously because he didn't have a name he didn't have he just had an address for this person and they're like well we need a name and it just gets so awkward and so like Mm. frustrating to try to report this because he's like he has to report the like screen name that he saw on the dating app um which was just like i don't know it was just like (laughs) like horny daddy like 32 or whatever come on it was 69 Um, there's no 32 yeah yeah so all of this is to say he tries to deal with it it doesn't work out so he goes back to his same old pattern and he starts like hooking up again and just like having casual sex and the show makes a really serious point about how much he's just like numbing himself by like yeah. going through person after person not even like being present for that experience yeah. until one fateful date <laughs> where he meets up with this guy and the guy says you're very beautiful and the guy offers to make dinner for the two of them and they both share a meal and the, and the guy the younger guy what's his name it's like kwame or something um he goes uh sorry the host goes you're very beautiful and kwame starts kissing him um and is like you know what do you want to do and they the host who had like made all this food was like oh we don't have to 
do anything. We can do other things. Um, and Kwame's like, what? Uh, and the guy is like, we can have some food. We can like watch a show. We can <laughs> like hang out or like go on a walk. And it becomes about this thing where he's saying like, you know, I want to date you for you. I don't just want to have sex with you and like, to, like just move on with my night. Um, yeah. And Kwame's like, what? You can't relate. Uh, and then, and then this guy who's hosting is like, I mean, you know, you can go if you want to, but all this food will go to waste. Um, and so like Kwame has like another bite of food and is like, I, th I think I am going to go. And then the guy's like, you don't have to, but if you want to, you can. Um, mm. Was there anything else you wanted to do before you leave or something like that? And Kwame goes, can I have a hug? Um, and they hug and Kwame cries and I cry <laughs> um, because there was just something about all of that build up, all of this in just insane stuff that this guy yeah. is going through. Um, and then this sense of, of yeah, just like numbing himself through sex and like not treating people as people um, and like totally just like going off the deep end um, and in a way just like burrowing himself more into loneliness and like disconnection from his friends and like from his own trauma and whatever else. Once he has this moment with this other guy who genuinely wants to connect with him, that shit's beautiful. Yeah. I loved it. You built that up beautifully. That was quite <laughs> the narrative arc you built there, sir. Oh boy. Um, that's, that's huge. And I think, I think that is a perfect example of how narrative how media and narrative in media can teach us, right? It is not just a waste. Like that's massive, especially for young queer youth, because I think because the queer community so much so is defined by sexual nature, right? Your sexual orientation, it, sex is, is like, it's kind of a big defining part of what it's all about that um, I think a lot of people fall into a space of thinking that it's all that they need to be about. It's all they can be because it's just about like, uh, you know, for those who are maybe there's some that are closeted and are doing it, some that are out and doing it. But there's, I think, a pervasive thing of like, I, I am, I either had shame around this or I, this, I was hiding this for so long that I need to experience it and put it out there and do as much, as much as possible of it. And that's all that I really am when they're, you know, if I don't know about you, but if anything, I've learned definitely that it's like being queer is one facet of who I am. And the human mm -hmm. condition is made up of thousands of facets. And so it's as much as it's a big facet of me, it's not my only one. And there's so many other things that I want that make me fulfill, feel fulfilled as a human, which includes things like intimacy, quiet time, hanging out, getting a hug, right? And, and so like that is a great lesson for somebody who's coming to terms with their own orientation. Hundo percento. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, personally, like I really value, um, the ability of like stories and empathy and just like taking people on these journeys and like just watching, you know, watching other people go through their life can be a very powerful, like empathic experience. Um, mm -hmm. but there are also just more direct forms of sharing information, like lectures and <laughs> documentary and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there any, um, do you have a favorite TED talk? Maybe we can close on on this. Yeah. Um, gosh. You know what? I don't really have like a favorite TED talk. Um, mm -hmm. One that I've used a lot because um, I've done a lot of teaching. Like I literally within work right now, I'm mentoring somebody around, you know, presentation skills and public speaking and that. And a piece that I often use as a reference point is Amy Cuddy. Amy Cuddy is this, um, mm. I'm sure her background, I think she's like a, a doctor or something. A definitely like well-educated woman who uh, teaches about the concept of power stances. Um, and, you know, some people might completely not believe in it. But um, the short of the long is ultimately is that by holding certain, like there's certain stances that you hold, the Superman pose or the like cheering athlete at the end of the, of the Olympic run that innately creates a chemical reaction in your body that reduces stress and makes you feel more confident and you can do this. Um, so it's just a technique. It's a way of doing something 
to better yourself. You know, it's all kind of part of personal development and feeling confidence. Uh, so those, you know, like there's tons of like lectures, like lectures are like almost literally like it's pulling out from fiction and pulling out from narrative and more about like, here's a fact of life. I'm a well-researched, educated person on this subject matter and media has captured me and presented you the ability to learn about it. Um, so that's one piece of millions. Totally. Yeah. My favorite Ted talk is probably, um, Brene Brown's vulnerability one. Have you seen is that? that the one where, did you see the one with the animation tied to it? Um, yeah, I'm sure it's happened. You know, um, the thing has like, and it it's like, like a, it's like an antelope or, like, or something. And it's talking oh. about the difference between like empathy and sympathy. Ooh, let's see. Maybe. I don't think I have seen this. Um, uh, there it is. It's the third, fourth one down. This one? Uh, yeah. Vulnerability in that. It's kind of talking about vulnerability. Oh, and cool. And, and it's, it's, this. it's super 14 cute. 14 million? And it's, it's been, oh yeah, 15 Ooh. million views almost. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because I think it's just used a lot in probably teaching and that. And it's just to, to talk about like vulnerability and, the, you know, using empathy versus sympathy and how it like what's what's the right use and when when to use it in that. Um, yeah. And it's great. It's a great little narrative. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Maybe I'll put a link in the in the show notes or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, I. Information. Knowledge is power. That's all I can really say. That's, <laughs> that's my closing quote. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's the antelope. The antelope's a dick. The antelope oh, is, okay. is the sympathy person as opposed to the empathy person. Oh, wow. But, yeah. Oh, that's powerful. Yeah. Someone really, um, really went for it with that character design. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> giving the, them all uh, these giant teeth. Yeah, I totally agree. I think like the thing that, you know, my takeaways from all this is that it goes to show that I think, you know, the documentaries you watched where they're talking about like media technology being a tool and it can be used for good and for bad uh, is true. Um, and there's new compounding problems that has come of the era of uh, the internet. Mm -hmm. But I think it is going to be with us we need to learn how to socialize people around it we need to learn how to be more responsible how we design it and there is the really shallow stuff to the really deep stuff yeah yeah there really is because i talked about books earlier and there are book length bits of content that you can find online there are like these like three hour lectures you can watch free college lectures if you know where to look online um and that is technically media you know um that is all through the internet and all of these other things uh mm -hmm. so i i look it's ending on the heart how perfect ending on the heart <laughs> and on your heart uh, so if anyone's still listening through all of this <laughs> all of my all my wild ravings um thank you so much for listening feel free to leave a like if you enjoyed this share it with a friend if you think they might get something out of this conversation and leave a comment what should they comment about robert maybe comment on how your relationship to media you know like mm. have you found it is uh adding to your life or removing you from life mm. That's beautiful. What did uh, what did I say the closing quote would be? Knowledge is power. <laughs> Knowledge is power. Is this, I feel like this is some sort of like NBC. The more you know, or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, if some, I look it up, we're gonna get Knowledge some Network clip art. thing. I don't know. We're definitely gonna knowledge? get some awesome clip art for this. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is stuff that belongs up on a on a classroom wall. Here we go. This is the one. <laughs> this is our closing graphic. Yes. <laughs> cool. Look at those pipes. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming. We will see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.